Hi, I'm Jimmy. In this video, we're looking at Caterpillar stock, ticker symbol CAT. This video is part of our Dow 30 series, where we're analyzing all 30 companies in the Dow Jones Industrial Average to see how good the overall businesses are and ultimately to see if the stocks are worth buying at their current price. I'll leave a link to the company analysis videos that we've completed so far. Okay, so first for Caterpillar, we're gonna start with Caterpillar's business. Then we're gonna jump into coming up with a fair value for Caterpillar's stock using discount of free cash flow. So let's jump right in. So Caterpillar breaks their business into two primary segments. Their largest segment is their machinery, energy, and transportation segment. And then their second segment, their smallest segment, is their financial product segment. Now their financial product segment generates revenue primarily through providing financing options for their customers and for their dealers that either wanna buy or lease the products that they create. So it, isn't a huge part of their overall business, but they do in fact make money there. Hence the reason we're bringing it up. But their largest segment is where they focus on mostly and where we should really focus on. Now in their annual report, they actually break down their revenue even further. This whole segment could be broken down like this. So these sub-segments, well, their largest sub-segment is their construction industries. And what this, industry, what this segment does is it makes machines for infrastructure, forestry, uh, building construction, Things, things along those lines. Then their energy and transportation segment, well, this targets, they target customers in the oil and gas industry, the power generation industry, uh, marine and industrial industries. They target railroads, the list goes on and on. They make a lot of generators, turbines, a ton of different engines and engine parts. Again, the list goes on and on. Caterpillar does a ton of different things and is in a, is in a ton of different industries. Their final industry is resource industries. And think of resources like the resources you might get out of the ground. Caterpillar products are used to extract things like uh, gold or coal, iron ore, copper, things along those lines, things that you get out of a quarry or a mine. Caterpillar products are used for that as well. That's where this revenue goes. And this brings us to some recent developments in the industry in general. So Caterpillar and their industry has been dealing with a lot of supply constraint issues recently. And this is resulting in this and a few other things resulting in higher materials costs. Obviously higher costs is a problem because you end up with lower margins. Now, Caterpillar's management has said that they can offset these higher costs by either increasing their prices or basically by selling a better mix of products that come with naturally higher margins. So if they can in fact increase prices, let's say, without reducing the number of products that they're selling, well, again, this could be a good thing as they're able to maintain their profit margins and continue to grow their business until expenses can be controlled a bit better. And based on the history, it seems quite possible. So this is a chart of their profit margins going back the past few years. And we can see that Caterpillar has actually done a very good job of gradually increasing their profitability numbers. It hasn't been a straight linear increase, but broadly speaking, numbers are better now than they were a few years ago. Yes, 2020 was a rough year, for Caterpillar and for many companies. But as we can see with these green bars here, what analysts are expecting for an increase in margins or margin recovery over the next couple of years. Now, I was curious how a company like Caterpillar or any company really could increase their margins from let's say mid single digit range to mid to low double digit range. You know, jumping from 6% to 10% is not easy. So this is actually a chart of the money that they've spent on restructuring costs. And it's been reported that since 2009, the estimates are out there that they've been able to save about $2 billion in fixed costs. Thanks to, I think they spent a little over $5 billion since 2009. And during that same time period, they've been able to save about $2 billion a year in fixed costs, which on an annual basis is fantastic because over the long run, that really adds to margins. So overall, you got to give management credit for improving the business like this. Okay, now let's move on to our calculation of fair value using discount of free cash flow for Caterpillar stock. So all we're trying to do with discount of free cash flow is we're trying to take estimates for free cash flow going on to the future and determine what those would be worth today. Now I'm using analyst estimates for free cash flow going out the next few years, and then we're discounting that by a required rate of return of 7.5%. This gives us a total company value of $231 per share. And then we want to adjust that for debt. So in theory, that's the value of the entire company. 
But if you paid off the debt, uh, so net debt, which is debt minus cash, how much is the stock actually worth? Well, now we can see the stock, the value of the stock drops to about $191 per share. Now, there are a couple important points we want to consider. First, when we make this adjustment here for debt, well, we want to make sure that we use interest bearing debt, both short and long term interest bearing debt, not the company's entire liabilities. We're just looking for the debt that they're paying interest on. I dove further into why we want to do this in a recent video I did where we analyzed Boeing. So if you're curious, I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. The other point that I think is important to point out, the other point to consider here, is that I've received a bunch of questions about the free cash flow estimates. So I did a discount on free cash flow tutorial video where I walked through how to do this entire calculation, way to get all the numbers, including how to come up with our own projections for free cash flow. But many times what I'll do is I'll take analyst estimates for free cash flow and I'll make adjustments to those if we need to. Oftentimes we could just take analyst estimates as they are, if you can get enough of them and you can use consensus estimates. Now there are two reasons that I do this. First, analysts spend a lot of time developing their financial models to project out the numbers. They speak to the management teams, they speak to competitors, so they do a ton to gather information to try to get their numbers to be as accurate as possible. And I think as a whole, broadly speaking, analyst numbers tend to be quite reliable. Now that's not to say that any one year is going to be exactly correct. It doesn't have to be exactly correct. We just need it to be close. And given the training and the time and the effort that goes, that analysts put into developing these estimates, well, I think it's a very logical place for us to start. Plus I should point out that because I'm using consensus estimates, which is basically just the average of a bunch of different analysts, well, these numbers do in fact change. They usually don't change a ton, but surely if anything big happens, well, that would change them. 2020 happened and that changed everybody's estimates. That was not expected. And it's those changes that ultimately the reason that I think we should continue to update our analysis on whatever companies we're watching the closest. And the second reason I actually start with analyst estimates is that it takes a ton of time to build a financial model to accurately predict something like free cash flow or to even get close with something like free cash flow. Now, I've actually done this in the past for different jobs that I worked before I started doing my own thing. And it makes sense to build financial models if you're only handling a couple of companies. Most analysts at professional investment banks are only covering a handful of companies, generally all in the same industry. So they do a much better job of predicting. I don't think we could do a better job of than what the average, what consensus estimates are. Therefore, it's simply a waste of time to try to build on our own numbers. Now, in the video that I did on discounted cash flow, showed us how to predict numbers. That is great if we can't come up with any other numbers. If we can't get analyst reports and we can't find any information on projections, then that's a great place to start. So again, it's a real time saver. That's primarily the reason I do it. Now, I should also point out that I know there's some criticism of analysts out there, and rightfully so, but there's criticism as to how reliable those numbers are. And I actually think that their numbers, these numbers, tend to be quite good. I mean, if we think about it, when a company reports earnings and the headline says something like, hey, uh, this company just beat earnings by three cents, it was analyst estimates that were projecting what those numbers would be. You know, if a company beat by three cents or missed by two cents, that's fairly specific. You got to do a ton of research to get that close with predictions. So that being said, I'm not sure I fully trust analyst estimates for target prices. I've seen that they tend to be biased based on what this stock is doing. So I, I don't really use, I actually don't look at their target prices at all. All I really use is their financial numbers. What numbers do they, what are they projecting for revenue? What are they projecting for free cash flow? And then we can build off of that and do our own thing. Okay, so with that being said, back to Caterpillar. Well, we got a fair value of $191 per share. Right now they're trading at about $215 per share. So like much of the stock market, it seems that Caterpillar is at least somewhat overvalued at this point. Now, personally, for those of you who've been following the channel for a while, you might know that I like to add a margin of safety to this, call it 10, 20%. I'd probably add 10% to Caterpillar because I think that they're a very solid business. 
So a minimal margin of safety seems very reasonable to me. So we'd wanna buy it about 10% lower than the 191. So if you're not sure how to come up with a margin of safety for the different companies we're analyzing, well, I actually did a video called when to buy a stock where I dive more into a margin of safety and how to assign a margin of safety to each company we analyze. So if you're curious, perhaps that's a good next video for you to watch. I got a link right here. I've got a link in the description below. And thank you so, so much for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. I really appreciate it. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next video.